Chapter Four of A Soldier of the Legion by George Mannington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part One: The Difficulties of Obtaining Military Intelligence, Native Spies, Ambuscades, Life at Nha Nam, Doi To, Delipte, A Tropical Storm, The Capture of Linh Nai, Monsieur de la Nassan, French Colonial Administration owing to the fact that the majority of the population of the yen Te were partisans of the de nam and also to the terror which this chief had inspired the remainder it was with the greatest difficulty that any information could be obtained concerning the organization and movement of the rebels notwithstanding the proverbial cupidity of the natives and that all intelligence was well paid for a special secret service fund being devoted to this purpose the military authorities found it almost impossible to learn what was going on or what might be expected to happen it was not until a regular system of espionage was instituted in april eighteen ninety one that any useful knowledge could be obtained a score or so of men from the native regiments who had furnished some proofs of courage were chosen and these disguised as travelling musicians beggars or peddlers wandered from village to village gleaning in the meantime all the information it was possible to obtain this they would communicate to the officers commanding the forts at nha nam and bo ha or to the intelligence department of the brigade at bac Nin these spies were instructed in certain signs and passwords which they used as a proof of their identity when they came to any of the centres with news and their arrival at and departure from these places were always effected secretly and at night by these means it became possible to the french officers to have some idea of what was going on in the lower yente but the knowledge obtained concerning the strength and situation of the rebels fortified positions in the north was extremely vague several of the spies had made attempts to penetrate into the region north of ha tuang some were turned back others who had probably excited suspicion were tortured and decapitated but none of them succeeded in obtaining a glimpse of the strongholds or in gaining any certitude concerning the paths which led to them however thanks to these spies it became known that important convoys of grain and foodstuffs coming from the villages near bac Nin were sent northwards twice a week by paths which passed a little to the west of our position and were not visible from it the usual time for the passage of these supplies near nha nam was from one to three in the afternoon at which hour owing to the heat the troops were under cover acting on orders received from general voyon who had just taken over the command of the second brigade at bac Nin, small parties were sent out on several occasions in hopes of surprising the convoy they were concealed in one of the deserted villages along the paths supposed to be frequented by the rebels and at points from which a good view of the track for some distance could be obtained i took part several times in these small expeditions one of them is perhaps worthy of mention since it provided some excitement for all those who assisted in it our detachment on this occasion consisted of eight legionaries and as many tirailleurs under the order of a corporal of our regiment we proceeded due south about three miles along the high road to cao tuang to a fine pagoda the wall of which skirted the highway just facing the entrance to the building and at right angles to the main road which it joined was a small path that ran across the fields to the west and was visible for about four hundred yards afterwards turning off sharp to the left behind a range of small hillocks covered with long grass at the apex of the angle formed by the junction of this path and the main road was a big banyan tree with a clump of bushes at its base it was here that our ambuscade was placed after a scouting party had gone through a big empty village situated just behind the pagoda and it was certain that there existed no sign of occupation or trace of a recent passage of the enemy 
Six legionaries, two natives, and the corporal remained behind the pagoda wall, and through the open brickwork in the top part of it they could see across the fields. Together with four tirailleurs, I was posted on the opposite side of the road. We were a little to the right of the others, our backs towards them, behind the clump of bushes at the foot of the banyan. Perched up on one of the branches of this tree and concealed by its dense foliage was a legionary who from the position he occupied obtained a fine view to the south and west, these being the only directions from which our position could be approached since the bamboo hedge of the village behind us skirted the road to the east for at least five hundred yards and nothing could come from the north without being seen by our sentries at nanam who had received orders to keep a sharp lookout it was ten in the morning before we had settled down our instructions were to reserve our fire and if possible capture one of the enemy alive the heat was terrible this was in the second week in june and the rains had not broken and although thanks to the shade from the tree above me i could doff my helmet and profit by the occasional light puffs of breeze just sufficient to move the airy foliage of the bamboo it required all my energy to fight against the invading drowsiness from time to time I would question the man in the tree in the hope that he would announce the advent of a troop, but he disappointed me each time with a reply in the negative. My attention was soon drawn to the four natives beside me, for I perceived that they were fast asleep. The natives possess a faculty of dropping into a sound slumber without respect to time or position, and these, though seated, their bodies bolt upright and their legs crossed before them, were snoring. The Tonkinese, like the Arabs, have a proverb which says, A man is better sitting than standing, better asleep than sitting, and better dead than asleep. However, this was no time to ponder on the ethics of Oriental philosophy, so I applied myself to awakening these weary ones, and after a good deal of vigorous shaking, succeeded in doing so. The corporal, who from his hiding-place had taken in the situation, adjured me, in low but energetic tones, to make use of the butt of my rifle to infuse enthusiasm into the unfortunate tirailleurs then all was quiet again and our weary watching was resumed the time seemed to drag along with painful slowness and the glare and the heat increased in intensity hardly a sound disturbed the drowsy tranquillity and had it not been for the chirping song of the cicadas and the far-away whistle of a kite which soared above us and whose shadow flitted occasionally across the open ground in front one could have imagined that there was nothing living for miles around. The sun began to move westwards, and its rays struck the white wall behind me, only to be reflected with such force that I was obliged to put on my helmet to protect the back of my head. It was nearly two in the afternoon when we were startled by a short exclamation from the sentry perched above us. "'What is it?' someone inquired there is something moving he replied a long way off two kilometers perhaps two men ah there are some who carry baskets nakes peasants going to market i suppose then with growing excitement in his tone he continued i see a glitter got for deck he was belgian the two men in front carry rifles they are the point yes yes the point further back there are more coolies with baskets and more men with rifles now two men on ponies where are they i tried to speak quietly but could have shouted with excitement on the path which runs behind the hillocks the path which turns in here they come from the south and walk very quickly whew he whistled there are quite sixty coolies and as many men with guns they have a rear guard the first will be on the path before us in ten minutes prevenez vite le corporal nous allons rire i ran across the road behind us through the gateway into the pagoda yard and informed our non-com though he was only half awake when i began for the heat had been too much for him he was quite alive to the situation before i had said many words and almost shook hands with me in his joy at the news don't shoot he said unless they are alarmed and run then shoot straight 
let them come up on the road here and we can collar one may pour l'amour le dieu keep an eye on your demoiselles i have no faith in them i went back to my hiding place hellinks the man in the tree said to me hurry up the two first will be around the corner in a minute or so i glanced at the tirailleurs they were kneeling now and throwing eager glances through the foliage in a low voice i told them to fix bayonets and load and noticed that the man next to me trembled like a leaf as he did so excitement i thought or was it fear from a deep bronze his skin had changed to a dirty yellow i should have known and taken away his weapon but this was my first experience mechanically i slipped my right hand into the pouch of my belt took out a cartridge and after wetting the bullet with my tongue slipped it into the open breech of my rifle and closed it now nothing moved and the only sounds that struck the ear were the song of the cicalas the whistle of the kite and the gentle rustle of the bamboos in the breeze suddenly round the corner of the last hillock came a man then a yard or so behind another though expected their actual appearance produced an impression of surprise perhaps because we had waited so long both wore a kind of uniform of green cotton cloth and putties of the same color their long hair was rolled in a silken turban of similar hue hanging on his shoulders suspended by a string which passed round the front of his neck each man had a big palm-leaf hat the sun glittered on their brass cartridges fixed on a belt round the waist and on the winchesters which they carried on the shoulder as a gardener carries his spade the end of the muzzle in the hand the butt behind them on they came at a sort of jog-trot and we could hear the pad 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 of their naked feet on the hot path now they were within a hundred yards of us and i fancied i could perceive a look of relief on the ugly flat features of the first as he glanced towards the pagoda the first of the long string of bearers with their bamboo and baskets were now visible coming along at a jerky run i felt something touch my left elbow and glanced around to find that hellinks had come down from his perch and was kneeling beside me the two armed men were quite near now we could see a bead of perspiration on the face of the first as it came from his hair and trickled down his forehead we could hear the regular short pant of his hard breathing note his half-open mouth and distinguish his black lacquered teeth pad 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 a soft puff of breeze brought to my nostrils the acrid odor of the perspiring native another few seconds and by thrusting my rifle through the leaves i could have touched his breast with the muzzle these two will surely be ours nothing can save them unable to control himself mastered by excitement or fear the tirailleur on my right suddenly sprang to his feet and shouted in the vernacular toi stop a doti where go you from the pagoda behind us i heard an angry murmur and could distinguish the corporal's voice kill the swine oh kill him hellinks cursed and groaned like a man struck with fever i felt that i had stopped sweating and a big lump rose from my chest into my throat and seemed to choke me i gave a great sob of disappointment and surprise the next instant we were on our feet for hellinks rose with me and as he shouted we can yet catch one i knew that he had a similar thought to mine but we had hardly taken the first step forward prior to forcing our way through the bushes and jumping down into the paddy field than we were blinded for a second by two bright flashes from a few feet in front of us and half deafened by the close report of the rebels winchesters the lin native soldier the cause of all the racket pitched head foremost into the foliage there was no time to lose so both of us rushed through the little cloud of smoke through the bushes and the next instant we were down in the field fifteen perhaps twenty yards away i saw the backs of the two green-clad natives who were running for dear life they were side by side in the field for the path was littered with the baskets and bamboos of the coolies who had disappeared as if by magic too late i shouted hellinks jerked up his rifle and covered the natives on the left 
the next instant acting on his example i was peeping along my sights and bringing them in line on to the middle of the palm-leaf hat which bumped as it hung on the receding back of the man to the right before i could press the trigger hellings had fired and a cloud of smoke floated across my line of vision it was gone in a second and i got my chance through the white puff from my rifle I saw a dark figure spring into the air with the pose of a marionette, of which all the strings have been jerked together, and, as I brought down my weapon, jerked out the empty cartridge and reloaded, I saw a dark mass lying motionless on the damp ground amongst the bright green stalks of young rice. "'Vita, Vita, you fool! Mine is winged and will escape if you do not hurry!' cried my comrade as he started off at the double. On we ran for about thirty yards. Then Helling stopped and, pointing to the ground, jerked out, "'I told you so!' and I saw a small blotch the size of a man's hand, which, as the bright sunshine played upon it, glittered red like a splendid dark ruby." these fellows have as many lives as a cat he continued hurriedly he was down and up again in a second limped away across the path into that tall grass on the right pointing in the direction come we may yet have him on we went a few more yards when the belgian came a cropper having tripped over the foot of the thing spread eagled in the rice field in his hurry he had passed too close i had given it a wide berth i came back to help him up and had to look at it there was a small round hole in the back of the neck just below the base of the skull hellings scrambled up panting how he cursed what are you staring at man take his gun quick bending down i picked up the winchester in doing so i almost touched the body and with difficulty suppressed a murmured i beg your pardon because i was dominated by a sentiment of awesome respect for the thing that had been and was no more i wished to walk softly on tiptoe and felt so thankful that he had fallen face downwards all this had passed in the space of a few seconds come back come back it was the corporal shouting to us, and there was a note of warning in his voice. Before turning to go I glanced up and saw a puff of white smoke arise, float for a second over the top of the hillock ahead, and I heard a report. Something struck the wet ground a little in front and to my right. A speck of mud hit me on the chin. Then, along a distance of fifty yards or so, the crest was covered with smoke and there was a rattle of musketry as we ran the ground and the air seemed to me to be alive and i could not go quickly enough to please myself hellings said between pants we forgot the cartridges oh damn the cartridges i replied and it was as if someone else had said it how far it seemed there were not more than forty yards how hot the sun was i believe i was terribly afraid during the few seconds it took us to get back to shelter again how we got back i don't remember i only know that i felt quite surprised to find myself standing somewhat blown behind the big tree telling my nomcom what had happened and feeling very anxious not to appear flustered hellings lay panting and laughing on the grass beside the other men three legionaries who were making caustic remarks concerning our running powers and five tirailleurs the latter were either kneeling sheltered by the tree or extended flat on the road their rifles ready to reply to the enemy's fire which was increasing in intensity to my explanation the corporal replied bon bon it was the fault of that dog of a native pity he was not hit killed they shot off his sucolo and he fainted three of our fellows and two tirailleurs are behind the pagoda wall to the right they can see the enemy's position from there go and take command of them i was an eleve caporal i e lance corporal at this time and follow up each volley we fire from here by another distance three hundred yards i went over to my little command my nerves steadied by the thought of the responsibility which was now mine i lined the men up each before an aperture in the open brickwork of the wall and recommended them to aim carefully and wait for the word of command before firing 
half sitting half lying with his head against the wall was the tirailleur who had been the cause of our abortive ambuscade the upper half of his face was scorched and blackened and a little red stream trickled down from forehead to chin he looked dazed and stupid and his eyes were half closed from his lips came a continual moan which he interrupted every few seconds to murmur tiet tiet dead dead my attention was called from him by the crash of a volley from the corporal's party as soon as the smoke had risen the smart rattle of our volley rang out three times i gave the same commands and each detonation seemed an echo to the one from the rifles of our comrades then there was a pause the enemy's fire had slackened considerably and the noise of the projectiles as they struck the wall and roof of the pagoda sang overhead or clattered through the branches of the banyan was hardly noticeable when compared to the racket they had kept up a few minutes before from the hillocks before us only occasional puffs of smoke arose followed by isolated reports from their rifles at his call i went out to our non-com who said they seem to be sick of it and certainly show no disposition to rush us i wish they would try sacre bleu the ground is too open for them if we could depend on the lens but we can't we might make a dash for the convoy without them the odds are too great so i have decided to withdraw i will start off with this lot when we have got away give them a volley to keep them still and if they show any signs of moving a little independent firing don't be extravagant though you understand yes i answered but you must take the wounded lin he would hamper me of course he replied sacre bon dieu i had forgotten the coward can he stand i don't think so thereupon he told two men off to fetch the poor beggar and i felt sorry for him when he appeared tottering though supported by the two legionaries as already explained the banyan tree and the bushes masked the pagoda gateway so that these movements could not be seen by the enemy he'll do said the corporal you two men hold on to him and help him to keep up here you this to another tirailleur tell him to run his best when we go this was explained and he nodded mumbled and would have started off alone if he had not been held he seemed in a hurry to get away and we all laughed now said our chief the brigade will retire by echelons then with a grin and a bow to me you monsieur will cover our withdrawal with your battalion when you hear a volley from us double out and rejoin with your party good luck to you bon chance i replied and went back to my men a couple of sharp orders and the others clattered by on the double the next minute the enemy's fire broke out with renewed vigor they probably thought that everybody had left for no bullets came our way crash went our volley at them but they still kept it up the running white men were too tempting a target i waited half a minute and ordered independent firing of four cartridges per man and joined in the fun this calmed them a little and i got my men outside sheltered behind the friendly banyan ready for the run as it was probable that the others would soon halt the road went off slightly to the right and was hidden from view by the corner of the wall we had not long to wait for in a few seconds the rattle of the rifles told me it was time to start so away we went in single file at the run we found the first detachment sheltered behind a ridge between two fields from whence they had fired two volleys to cover our withdrawal no one had been hit the only damage done being to the stock of a rifle belonging to a man who had retreated with me which had been smashed by a rifle bullet there can be no doubt that the rebels were very poor shots at anything over a hundred yards and it is doubtful if any of them knew how to hit a running object it was not for us to grumble at this however their fire ceased completely as soon as we had joined forces this was due probably to the fact that owing to the continued sound of firing the piquet from nha nam had been sent out to meet us though we were unaware of this as a slight rise of the ground hid the fort from us we moved off cautiously and very soon met the relief 
this detachment about fifty strong went on in hope of engaging the enemy but were disappointed for although they occupied the hillocks from which we had been fired upon the rebels had not waited for them but retreated together with the convoy leaving behind them but a few baskets of rice so terminated my first experience under fire from a visible enemy that night we were awakened and remained under arms for an hour for the enemy amused themselves by treating us to a long-range fire it was a waste of ammunition for nobody was hurt and we did not reply some of my comrades suggested that this was a reprisal for our ambuscade of the afternoon personally i am inclined to believe that it was a fainted attack on our position designed to engage our attention and ensure the passage of the belated convoy which had escaped us the weather grew hotter every day and several cases of heat apoplexy and fever occurred in our little garrison it is probable that the fever was due to the digging which had taken place during the construction of our fortifications this was inevitable of course but it is always very dangerous to break new soil in these districts since the surface to the depth of three or four feet is mainly composed of decayed vegetation in which the malaria microbe is abundant all the newcomers were of course victims to prickly heat in addition to which many of us were afflicted with small boils these would not come one or two at a time but sufferers were literally covered with them i was one of the first to pay toll to this extremely painful malady in addition to these unavoidable inconveniences the whole company suffered from another discomfort which was a cause of deep complaint on the part of the men since it was due to the neglect of our commissariat department because some trifling formality had not been executed mosquito nets were not served out to us till late in july and the lack of them caused many hours of sleepless agony during the hot nights a surprising amount of red tapeism still remained in the commissariat department of france's colonial army and though this branch was remodeled in the beginning of 1901, it is generally acknowledged that the authorities responsible for the new order of things have obtained little or no improvement in this respect. In July, the heat became tremendous. The afternoons, which were the hottest part of the day, averaging 110 degrees in the shade. The men were kept indoors from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon, and operations were restricted to short reconnaissances which took place either in the early morning or in the evening these excursions were always made to the south east or west but not northwards as orders had been received from the brigade to abstain from penetrating into the enemy's country until the summer months had passed in consequence the garrison of nha nam disposed of a good deal of leisure time which the men made use of according to their varied tastes making cloth belts embroidered with flags and other warlike devices was a favorite pastime with many books and newspapers were in great demand and a fortnightly convoy from fulang tuang which brought the european mail was an incident of importance to all a rifle range had been built about five hundred yards to the west of our position and each morning saw some unit of the garrison at practice close to the fort on the southwest side was a small village inhabited by the camp followers wives and children of some of the native troops it contained one small store kept by a chinaman at which the troops could obtain tobacco tinned goods and strong drinks the sale of intoxicants was however subjected to strict regulation any infringement of which would have entailed the peremptory closing of the storekeeper's establishment the men not on duty were allowed to go into the village from five to seven p m only so that would-be topers had small facilities for overindulgence and cases of drunkenness were few and far between thirsty souls could obtain good wine from the government stores in the fort at a very reasonable price though this supply was with reason restricted to half a litre a little more than a pint a day per man 
Our diet was good, for the natives from some of the surrounding villages brought in a plentiful supply of eggs, poultry, pork, fruit, and yams, which were readily purchased, as the troops received a mess grant in addition to their daily ration of bread, fresh meat, coffee, sugar, rice, and salt. During the period of comparative inaction, and profiting by the leisure at my disposal, I made an attempt at learning the Annamese language. Progress was very slow, for the vernacular, like Chinese, is composed of a multitude of sounds, many of which are so similar to each other that only a well-trained ear can distinguish the difference. Also there exists neither alphabet nor grammar to aid the student, and success depends entirely on the possession of a good memory and inexhaustible patience. In writing this language, the natives use the Chinese characters, each representing a sound, and the extent of knowledge of their literati class is gauged by the number of these each individual has succeeded in retaining. Thus a native who has passed examinations, which prove that he possesses five thousand characters, is said to be clever and one who has shown that he can make use of double that quantity is considered to have reached a very high standard of education indeed as in the chinese and japanese languages many words possess an honorific as well as a common form thus an official in speaking to an inferior will refer to himself by using the word tao i but in conversing with a superior this form of pronoun in the first person becomes toy i it is needless to state that this peculiarity adds considerably to the difficulties the student has to reckon with during my search for an insight into the native tongue i came in contact with one of the native sergeants known as doi to doi sergeant and to a mountaineer this non-commissioned officer belonged to the hardy and brave mountain tribes of northern tonkin mention of which has already been made he had distinguished himself on several occasions, and especially so during the operations against Utwe in December and January. In appearance and in his love of danger he bore a strong resemblance to a Gurkha, and the following account of an incident which took place during one of the attacks on the rebel stronghold, related to me by a legionary who was present, will give the reader some insight into the character of this plucky little soldier and indeed into that of his fellow tribesmen of whom he was a good example during one of the first engagements a section of the native regiment under the orders of a lieutenant succeeded in reaching the first palisade from behind the trees or lying flat on the ground the men opened a smart fire on the rebel position which was returned with vigour and punctuated by oriental abuse composed of rude remarks concerning the individual family of each terrier and the graves of his ancestors doi to maddened by these insults stood up in full view of the enemy and poured forth upon them a torrent of curses and invective in their admiration of his daring and their surprise at the volubility and scope of his abuse most of the combatants forgot to fire and a momentary lull took place in the engagement it lasted a few seconds only for lashed to fury by the stinging retorts of the speaker every rifle on that side of the rampart was turned upon him his sacolo and cartridge cases were shot away and his clothes riddled with bullet holes and it is probable that his body would have resembled a sieve had not his lieutenant sprung forward and dragged the howling mountaineer into safety behind a big tree after this the rebels fire slackened and they shouted friendly invitations to the native troops to kill their officers and join them saying that de nam would treat them well and would give one hundred dollars for every head of a french officer they would bring in to replied with renewed invective from behind the tree where he had been ordered to remain and each pause made through want of breath he punctuated with a shot from his rifle when the engagement was over and the troops were retiring to nanam the lieutenant aforementioned asked the little sergeant if he thought the promises of the rebels were bona fide ones the nearest translation of doto's reply in bad french 
was something after the following mm, they belong big liars suppose i bring your head mon lieutenant perhaps i get ten dollars only he and i soon became fast friends and of an evening before the door of the fort was closed i would sometimes go for an hour to his canya native hut and sit and talk with him whilst his wife prepared his evening meal of rice dried fish prawns and native salad while we discussed the topics of the day his sons two sturdy pot-bellied brats aged respectively five and seven naked as they were born would squat down on the floor of beaten clay and stare open-mouthed at me his meal dispatched the little sergeant would stretch himself out on a clean rice straw mat placed on a platform-like bed made of split bamboo which covered half the room his wife would then bring in a hardwood tray whereupon was a diminutive lamp a bamboo opium pipe with a blue clay bowl some little skewer-like implements of silver and a tiny box of the same metal containing the daily ration of this seductive drug to would lie on his right side a hollow block of green enameled earthenware serving as a pillow beneath his head his wife would stretch out opposite to and facing him between them was placed the tray with its little implements and the lamp was lit this was the solemn moment of the day end of chapter four part one Chapter Four of A Soldier of the Legion by George Mannington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part Two. To reached out his skinny little brown hand and picked up his pipe, fondling it an instant prior to warming the bowl in the flames. His keen black eyes glancing over his favorite with the fond look of satisfaction and gratitude one sees on the face of a man who greets a well beloved wife this pipe if such it can be called for neither in bowl nor stem did it resemble the instrument we give that name to was of similar form to that used by all orientals who inhale opium fumes it consisted of a stem about two feet long of polished bamboo about one and a half inches in diameter the lower end being closed by an ivory cap while the other extremity was covered by a disc of silver with a small round hole in the center of it to this the lips were placed when the fumes were inhaled about six inches from the lower end of the stem the bamboo was pierced to receive the neck of the bowl shaped like a hollow flat bulb the top had a diameter of about three inches and was well polished and slightly convex in the middle was a tiny hole about as big as a pin's head it is perhaps as well to explain that no opium gets into the bowl for it is consumed over the hole in the smooth convex surface on the top owing to the air in the bulb having been inhaled and the consequent creation of a temporary vacuum thus only the fumes pass through the little orifice up the stem and into the lungs of the smoker now to was warming his pipe over the flame of the lamp withdrawing it now and then to gently polish the surface of the bulb upon the sleeve of his khaki jacket his better half dipped one of the little silver skewers into the tiny pot and after turning it round drew it out covered with a coating of the rich brown drug which looked like thick treacle this she held over the flame for a second it frizzled and gained in consistency she withdrew it and dipped it again into the drug and it increased in volume three or four times this operation was repeated until there was sufficient opium in the skewer to make a good pipe the dub now held his pipe in his mouth and the tip of the flame licked the smooth warm surface of the bowl on which his spouse began to roll the opium holding the other end of the pipe in her left hand to steady it her dexterity was marvellous in a few seconds the drug was detached from the skewer and was rolled into a little ball about the size of a pea she threw a glance at to which meant are you ready he nodded and started drawing at the bamboo a gentle movement and the skewer pushed the ball of opium onto the tiny hole and it was held just over the lamp 
there was a frizzle as the drugs began to burn continuing under the steady prolonged suction of the smoker there was no smoke for it was all going up the pipe into the little brown man's lungs his eyes were half closed and his features expressed a gentle beatitude but his chest was swelling swelling soon he could not continue the steady suction and he drew at the bamboo with a succession of small quick pants his wife in the meanwhile held the bowl well over the flame and pushed up to the orifice the tiny particles of the drug still adhering to the convex surface presently all was consumed i on seeing this for the first time sighed with relief as one who had escaped from witnessing a catastrophe when the smoker opened his mouth and allowed the black smoke to escape slowly from between his lacquered teeth which shone like ebony in the dim light of the tiny lamp to watched the opaque column as it climbed slowly upwards to the bamboo cross-poles of his hut and forming into a little cloud clung to the thatch of the roof yet good he exclaimed and then prepared for another the air in the tiny room was now heavy with the odor of the drug which at first seemed acrid and unpleasant but it improved on acquaintance and soon became soothing and enjoyable the dove liked to smoke his opium in peace and knowing this i sat waiting until he should see fit to break the silence outside the day was fast drawing to a close and the short eastern sunset would in a few minutes be changed into night from the chinaman's shanty a few paces away came the sound of a rollicking ditty sung by some of my comrades over a pint of wine or a glass of absinthe the noise seemed to wake all the sicarlas in the neighbourhood for they started at once a concert of chirping whistles in the half-dried-up pools outside the village thousands of noisy members of the Betrachian tribe broke into an endless chorus of complaint at the unwanted dryness of the season while from time to time their big uncles the bullfrogs added a booming croak of approval the matting hanging before the doorway of the hut swung back a little moved by a hot breeze which brought to the nostrils a whiff of flowers and vegetation in decay and i could see the fireflies already circling down the little street or about the thatch-covered cañas the heat was terrific and seemed if possible less supportable now than it had done during the hours of blinding scorching sunshine all the earth seemed to radiate the caloric it had been stoking up during the day when would the rains break those rains the other men who knew had told me of rains that chilled you to the bone and made your teeth chatter the thought that in the past it seemed years ago i had somewhere shivered with the cold made me laugh aloud as after throwing off my light cotton jacket and rolling up my shirt sleeves i sat mopping the perspiration from my forehead the veins of my neck seemed to swell and my breath came in gasps thinking that it might be somewhat cooler there i stepped into the street and taking out my pouch tried to roll a cigarette three times the thin paper broke in my sticky perspiring fingers before i succeeded in obtaining a damp and flabby apology for a smoke this slight exertion had caused me to perspire from every pore and it seemed hotter outside than within my light clothes clung to my limbs like those of a man pulled out of a pond disgusted i returned and sat down again on the edge of the bed and after endless difficulty succeeded in lighting my damp cigarette with a still damper match the tiny twinkle of the opium lamp deepened the darkness outside the small circle of its light toe's brownish-yellow features on which it shone reminded me of a quaint and clever old japanese ivory i had once seen and the dark background of the night was like the black velvet-lined case which had contained it from where i sat i could see the arm of the sergeant's wife bare from the elbow and i watched with a kind of sleepy fascination her small and nimble fingers as they manipulated the drug the soft light gave to her skin a rich gold tint and made the arm and hand look graceful and comely the rembrandt-like effect of the picture gripped me and for the moment the heat was forgotten 
Tho's voice brought me from a waking dream, when, after laying down his pipe, he said, Patience, comrade, it will come. When the bullfrogs join in the song, the great waters are not far off. Were you on sentry tonight, you would hear the dreary note of the rainbird, for I'd stake a week's pay she will be out. Ba, his wife, tells me it sang today before sunrise, but women were ever dreamers. The little woman looked up from her task of cleaning the silver skewer and retorted, Dreamers? O oh, great slaughterer of men, and dost thou give me time to dream? Is not my life as full of work as our mountain rise is full of fat? Am I not still a To from the Dam To? A group of mountains to the west of Tai Nien. Are not my teeth white, though I have a husband who has blackened his and become a plainsman? As she smiled at her own wit, I caught a flash of ivory between her red lips, and noticed for the first time the regularity of her small features. The Doi smiled good-naturedly and replied, Oh, thou silly one, thou art pretty as an angry parakeet, and talkest faster. Then to me, had I not lacquered my poor teeth, though my ancestors know the grief I suffered from it, how could I have gone, dressed like a peddler, to spy in the villages for the government? Had I tried so to do, the Danam would have eaten my liver long since. As it is, some day I shall probably eat his. Ba, get ready another pipe for me. Nay, nay, she answered, as she lit a small kerosene lamp of German make, and placed it on the bed. Thou hast eaten ten times of the drug, and it is thy just ration. She blew out the small light and carried away the tray, saying to me as she did so, Were I to listen to this man, he would turn all the government dollars he gets into black smoke and I and my sons would have to go in shame to my father and beg for food. It was very evident that Madame Ba ruled the roost, and it was probably better so. Tho growled a little and protested to me, Was ever man burdened with such a wife? She has no respect for me, the senior sergeant in the company. Now, had I married, here he was interrupted by the first notes of the bugle calling us back to the fort, and we rose together and hurried out of the hut. It was quite dark outside. Tho did not speak until we had nearly reached the gate, and then he said, Camarade, when the time comes, I hope you will find for yourself a white woman with a heart like Ba's. Bonne nuit! And he ran off to his section. Lying on my bed that night, I communicated to my neighbor, Lipti, a Hungarian, the incidents of the evening, and together we laughed over the recital of Little Toe's domestic worries. This roommate of mine had come out with our detachment on the Benoit. On our arrival at Nanam, we had been given beds next each other, and our acquaintance was fast ripening into a close friendship. Lipti had joined in April of the preceding year. Shortly before this, he held a commission in the Austrian army, which he had resigned. A braver, more loyal, and upright nature I have never met. I have never learnt the reason which brought him into the legion, but am convinced they were honourable, for during the four years we were almost continually together, his speech and conduct were always those of a gentleman in the truest sense of the word. He was an adept at military topography, and to while away the time would give me further lessons in this useful art, of which I had already some slight knowledge. This having reached the ears of our captain, we accompanied in turns the occasional reconnoitring parties, and made topos of the route taken. His work was of the first quality, and his draftsmanship of a very high order. The following morning I came across To, who was conducting the sick men of his detachment to the doctor. He halted an instant to ask me if I was coming to see him that evening, and I told him I should be deprived of that pleasure, as my section was on piquet duty at 5 p.m. At this he grinned and said, "'Well, then, we shall meet later, for there will be some fun tonight.' He then left me and trotted off to rejoin his men." I know it was no good trying to obtain further information from him, for the doy was like the majority of Orientals from whom torture will not wring a secret they have decided to keep, so I did not attempt to see him again that day. 
however as i knew that he served as interpreter to our commander when spies were interrogated i inferred from the hint he had given me that some movement was to be made that night my section assembled and were inspected with the guard that evening and afterwards we were dismissed but had to remain dressed and armed in our room in the event of our services being required i took lipte into my confidence and told him of the tip i had received i induced him to do as i did and fill his water bottle with cold coffee in case of necessity fully dressed with our belt and cartridge cases on we lay down on our cots to snatch a few hours rest at one a m our squad corporal shook us out of our slumbers and together with the other men of our section we snatched up our rifles and assembled outside as quietly as possible here we found a half section of native troops under the orders of to who nodded to me and grinned as i stepped up and took my place in the ranks two hard-boiled eggs and a slice of bread were served out to each man which we were told to put in our wallet for future use a few minutes later captain plessier came upon the scene and noticing that he was not mounted i surmised that our coming peregrinations were to take place over difficult ground so indeed it proved for after the gate had been opened by the sentry our little column went out in silence like a troop of ghosts in indian file turned to the right and proceeded to the southwest across the paddy fields by the narrow ridges which served as paths the night was stifling and pitch dark so dark indeed that each man had to hold on to the wallet of his comrade in front so as not to lose his way thus progress was very slow when we had been walking about an hour and had covered perhaps a mile and a half the blackness of the night was of a sudden lit up by a brilliant flash of lightning which illuminated for the fraction of a second the surrounding country the weird aspect of it with the tall outlines of the palms and bamboo silhouetted against the sky remained with a strange vividness as if photographed upon the retina for several minutes this was succeeded by a peal of thunder so deafening that it seemed to split the eardrums and shake the ground beneath us and the rain came down as it only can do in the tropics for a few seconds our little troop was thrown into confusion and some of the men temporarily blinded by the sudden light stepped into the fields where they floundered about with water and mud almost up to their knees after this interruption we proceeded on our way very slowly though for the lightning continued flash following flash in quick succession for an hour and our ears were weary with the crashing of the thunder the track which was of clay was sodden and slippery we were all wet through to the skin and our boots full of water emitted a curious squashing sound at each step fortunately the din of the thunder and the continued thresh of the rain more than covered the noisy advance of our column ten minutes before wet through with perspiration i had mentally cursed the heat now my teeth were chattering and my fingers were numbed with the cold i felt a strange joy at it smiled to myself at the evident truth of to's recent prophecy anent the great waters and thought how appropriate was his term for the downpour for two hours we continued on our slippery way and were then halted on a patch of grass covered with little mounds a village graveyard here our expedition was broken up into little parties the one to which i belonged being composed of ten legionaries and a sergeant and as many tirailleurs with tow at their head we proceeded a short distance and were ordered to be down in some long grass behind a clump of cactus and hibiscus shrubs as we did so i heard the dog say to our sergeant when it will be light we shall see the door of the village from here the path to it is a little to our left from this and the movements i could hear on our right and left i gathered that the remainder of the column was surrounding a village which lay before us but owing to the darkness and the rain i could distinguish nothing ahead of me we had been lying on the ground some minutes and notwithstanding the chill dampness i was almost falling into a doze for the walk had tired me when from the surrounding darkness a figure came noiselessly and crouched beside me 
The next instant Toe's voice whispered in my ear, I told you so. It has come. Yes, I shivered, and I think I have had enough of it. Nay, say not so. A few more hours and you will grumble at the heat once more, camarade. Tis a fool who ever complains. Our land had sore need of the rain. The crops will drink this as the mandarin does his Yunnan tea. When the sun rises, all the earth will rejoice. The voice of the tempest has shut the ears of our enemy to the noisy approach of the Linabnaxa, European soldier. This time we shall surely surprise the brigands. Therefore we should thank our Lord Buddha for his great mercy. What village is before us, friend? Yen Tru, he answered, and in it is a Lin Min, sergeant, of the Danam with twenty men. They are collecting the taxes and were to have left it this morning. But they will never leave it, he added with a low chuckle. Yesterday the spies came and told the captain, I was there. Last night they surely feasted, drank much chum chum, rice alcohol, and smoked many pipes, for the headman is a great traitor and in secret a partisan of Ham Nhi. We shall have much trouble to enter, I ventured, for we have not brought axes. To chuckled again and said, Let not that trouble thee. I have devised the Ong Quang Ba, the captain, literally lord of three stripes, and these fools will open the door themselves even as i said to him i turned to chide him for his presumption but he had glided away silently into the night the rain had ceased now almost as suddenly as it had commenced and the smell of the damp earth and vegetation reeked in the nostrils turning i glanced behind me and saw that towards the east the sky was grey in a few minutes the forms of my comrades near by could be dimly distinguished the nearest, he was barely a yard away, was a boy of twenty, an Alsatian. He was fast asleep, his head pillowed on his arm, and dreaming pleasantly, for on his lips, which bore no trace of a moustache, I could discern a smile. Fearing lest the sergeant should find him thus, I awoke him, and he thanked me. It was now so light that a few paces away to the left I recognized our captain seated on the ground. He was chewing the end of an unlit cigar. In a low voice he called the sergeant and talked for some moments to him. Then our non-com came from one to the other of us and communicated the instructions he had just received. These were, load and fix bayonets as quietly as possible, lie still until the signal is given by the captain with his whistle, then rise at once and rush for the village gateway and on into the houses beyond. Weapons not to be used until resistance is offered, and every effort must be made to capture an enemy alive. By looking through the foliage before us we could now see in the yet dim light that we were close to a pond or moat covered with rank duckweed and lotus plants. On the other side of this was a big village surrounded by the usual embankment and bamboo hedge. Presently we could hear the crowing of cocks, barking of dogs, and other sounds of awakening life. The pond was crossed by a dike about six feet wide, forming a path leading to the heavy gateway of the hamlet. This was yet closed. By this time the eastern sky was a bright red violet, and against it the great leaves of the plantains, the spiky foliage of the macaw palms, and the delicate leafage of the bamboo seemed to be cut out of tinfoil, reminding me of a tropical scene from a drama stage in one of our large London theatres. The birds were out, troops of white-breasted jays scurried from tree to tree with an uncouth cry sparrows darted about with an endless twittering and several carrion crows started a concert among the areca palms inside the village suddenly on the horizon there was a glitter and a convex curve of fire appeared the mighty ball of the blinding sun rose inch by inch from the rice fields the wet surface reflecting its light with dazzling vividness it was already hot, and our sodden linen grew stiffer and drier each instant. 
all attention was now turned to the village and behind the gate came the noise of withdrawal of bolts and bars the heavy ironwood portal swung open and out stepped a water buffalo on whose back straddled a naked youngster gripping tightly a cord attached to the iron ring in the animal's nostrils just outside the unwieldy beast halted its big head and throwing its great horns right back sniffed the air its eyes seemed turned towards our hiding place but there were others behind who were impatient to get out and a native woman darted forward and beat the beast's buttocks with a hoe the boy on his back unconscious of the danger in front drummed his little heels on the black hairless sides and the animal moved slowly and reluctantly forward one two three of the beasts stepped out a fourth was already in the doorway when suddenly came the shrill order from the whistle in an instant we were up and racing like madmen for the causeway almost before the natives with their cattle had realized what had happened lipte was in front leading me by six feet we had been lying nearest to the path to was panting along at my side my hungarian chum was now on the dike but he slipped on the wet clay and came down with a crash both of us jumped clear of him and went sliding along for several paces on the slippery surface soon we were up to the first buffalo which was trying to turn to leaned forward and drove his bayonet into its hind quarters with a roar it leaped off the path and fell with a mighty splash into the pond the boy still clinging to its back i heard a peal of laughter somewhere behind me on we went again and the next instant were at the door in which two of the beasts were wedged again the doy steel darted out and one of the animals with a bellow of pain was forced through like a cork pushed into a bottle in our ears rang the yells of the natives beseeching each other to close the way the next instant we were through and i saw a native heroically striving to pull away a bamboo pole so as to let fall an inner gate but before he could do so the rearmost buffalo which was lumbering along in headlong flight cannoned against him and he was knocked sprawling to had slipped in front for we were now running in a narrow lane where only one could pass at a time the sides were walls of thick sun-dried clay in which at irregular intervals were little round loopholes no one fired from them though a few seconds had passed since the first alarm was given behind us came the clatter of nailed boots and i turned to see that lipte his khaki and accoutrement caked with mud had caught up with us he laughed and puffed as my eye caught his every few yards the narrow way twisted and turned we saw nothing but could hear the cries of alarm of the natives and the thumping gallop of the terrified buffaloes just ahead suddenly the doy turned off to the left through a door in the wall and the next instant we were in a kind of courtyard covered with red tiles in the middle was a guava tree in full bloom and facing us a thatch-covered native house with green blinds of split bamboo hanging from the roof as we advanced one of these was lifted and a tall lank native holding a winchester at the ready confronted us his hair was long and hung over his shoulders his eyes still full of sleep had a fierce wild glare in them we spread out and advanced towards him the lutuang headman opium drunk said to surrender to us the native spat at him jerked up his weapon fired at the door and missed him already he had pulled back the lever preparing to shoot again when lipte's rifle spoke his weapon fell with a clang to the tiles and his two hands clasped to his breast he staggered back against the screen which gave way and fell doubled up under the veranda with his back against the wall of the house he watched us as we came to the door his mouth opened and he tried to curse deo deo then he coughed and a rush of blood choked his words he toppled over on his side as our three rifle butts descended on its surface splintering the wooden door of his abode he had done his best to defend his guest the scene inside was a strange one we had expected resistance but found none and were perhaps disappointed in consequence on a big wooden couch 
and inside a green mosquito curtain lay a man dressed in cream-coloured silk beside him was a tray on which i saw the little silver box the skewers and the lamp the latter was burning and the brilliant stream of sunshine pouring through the broken door seemed to drown its flicker the man's face was long and emaciated and as the light struck it i noticed that his skin was very fair for a native that he wore a green silk turban and that his hair was carefully rolled the fingernails of his left hand which held the pipe over the flame were very long that of the little finger being at least four inches on the index finger of the same hand was a massive gold ring beside him lay a woman who was tending the opium even as i had seen ba do a few hours earlier she was dressed in a long stole-like garment of bright green neither of the pair moved or looked towards us and for a few seconds their indifference to our presence seemed complete and contemptuous when he had finished the pipe he had been smoking he sat up and nodded to to who saluted him in the vernacular saying as he did so lin bin you must surrender and come with us fools but not grave men resist the inevitable there was a tremor in his voice and a gleam in the little sergeant's eye that said only too plainly how gladly he would have slain the rebel then and there i noticed a glitter on the floor near the bed bent down and picked up a spencer carbine and a belt full of cartridges attached to it was a hunting knife in a leather sheath and a holster containing a revolver of an american pattern the lin bin slid off the couch and stood before us cannot i die now he said to to no no we are to take you alive such are the orders which must be obeyed then to me camarade you who are as strong as an ox will you hold his arms behind his back one little moment i did as he requested and the doy took the green turban from the head of our prisoner and tied his elbows together leaving about a yard of the silk loose the end of which he wound round his own wrist then we left the hut with our captive as we passed under the veranda i saw that the lu chuang was lying on his side and seemed to be sleeping peacefully he was quite dead Lipte picked up the Winchester and walked with me behind To, before whom was the prisoner. We noticed that they were talking together in quite a friendly manner. The woman was following us, and I could hear the low sobbing complaint which she kept up as she trotted behind. We could hear much shouting and the explosion of firearms in the village not far from us, and it was evident that the rebels were offering a stubborn but tardy resistance guessing the importance of our capture and fearing a rescue both lipte and myself shouted to 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 hurry on and we all started off at a trot outside we found the captain attended by a bugler our commanding officer was seated on a mound watching the gateway and smoking his cigar when we got up to him he said what have we here a rebel mon capitaine answered lipte de lin bin mon capitaine i replied lin yi mon capitaine replied to who had learnt the name of the prisoner and two rifles and a pretty girl added the officer with a laugh then he continued leave all here in charge of calvert the bugler you doy go back to your section you two men rejoin sergeant beaven in the village and tell him to get his detachment together and rejoin me here when we reached the sergeant all resistance had terminated and the men were foraging in the huts or securing the prisoners we communicated the orders the little column assembled outside again and we learned that two of our men had been slightly wounded we had captured six prisoners taken nine rifles and five of the enemy had been killed the surprise had been complete although few if any of us realized the importance of the capture we had made it will presently be seen that our morning's work produced results which eventually aided not a little towards the success of the operations on a large scale undertaken against the rebels at the beginning of the following year we reached nha nam at eleven that morning and an extra ration of wine was served out to us as a compensation for the drenching we had received our prisoners were lodged under the veranda of the house occupied by the native troops 
where there was a barre de justice heavy ironwood stocks in which the right leg of each of the captives was secured a guard furnishing two sentries was placed over them they were well fed and suffered no cruelty or insult but having been captured in armed rebellion there existed no doubt as to what their ultimate fate would be it is now necessary to give some details concerning the important changes which were taking place at this time in the administration of the country the government in paris influenced no doubt by the growth of rebellion and rapine in the colony had decided upon the appointment of a governor-general armed with greater power than his predecessors for this purpose a decree dated twentieth april eighteen ninety one was issued by the french cabinet which accorded that functionary great freedom of action according to the new order of things the governor was vested with absolute power in the colony and both the civil and military authorities therein were entirely under his control all appeals or reports made by the heads of departments in indochina to the minister in the metropolis were to pass through his hands at this time m piquet the governor was just returning to france and the ministry appointed m de lanessan a radical deputy who had already given proofs of superior ability in parliamentary circles and who was acknowledged to be a man possessing great initiative energy and activity the new governor-general arrived in the east in may and although his enemies have reproached him and not without some cause with want of tact and conciliation towards the military authorities there can be no doubt that from his administration dates the era of commercial progress which still continues in indochina he was the first to insist on the necessity of constructing railways and good roads in the colony and much as he did in this respect for the first railway to lang son owes its origin to him he would undoubtedly have done more had he not been hampered by the restricted finances at his disposal as it was by his vehement insistence on the subject he caused the investing public of france to realize the latent wealth existing in tonkin for the development of which it was absolutely necessary to construct good means of communication he thus paved the way for his successors messieurs rousseau and dumay who thanks to his propaganda eventually secured large loans guaranteed by the government enabling them to construct a system of railways now almost terminated traversing the whole of france's eastern empire and penetrating into two of china's wealthiest provinces quang si and yunan the first care of m de lanessan was to put an end to the intrigues existing at the court of wei having for their object the dethronement of the young king dante and the restoration of the exiled Hamni to power also he took urgent measures to restore order in tonkin to obtain these results he inquired into the grievances of the natives and adopted pacific methods when possible but when these were of no avail he did not hesitate to employ rigorous and repressive measures he undoubtedly possessed the necessary qualities for an administrator and organizer and a few months after his arrival the residents of local mandarins vied with each other in stamping out with the aid of the native militia the seeds of revolt and discord sown in the delta so that he was able to turn his attention to the central northern and eastern districts of the colony where rebellion and piracy existed in an armed and rampant state to ensure success in this work of pacification m de la sonne made every effort to do away with the rivalry among the regular troops and the native militia the latter being controlled by the civil residents to obtain this result he created in the unsettled provinces military zones districts wholly administered by officers in the army so that the powers and responsibilities of the different authorities were clearly divided and defined the all-powerful military authorities were alone responsible for all that went on in the region committed to their care and to the civil authorities was entrusted the administration of the delta provinces 
this system proved such an excellent one that it has been maintained to this day with few modifications and at the beginning of nineteen o three there were in tonquin four military zones divided up into nine districts with a total population of about two million and a superficial area of twenty thousand square miles thanks to the system introduced by m de lanessan organized rebellion no longer exists in the colony and although the provinces bordering on quang si and quang tung are occasionally ravaged by the chinese bands which cross the frontier the pacification of the country may be said to be complete that the commercial progress of the colony was a slow one at this period there can be no doubt but it was owing principally to the want of means of communication with the interior and also to the prohibitive customs tariff and exorbitant transit rates on goods passing through to china which had been adopted by the french government today things have considerably improved thanks to the railways already built and they will go on improving when all the lines are completed but unless the authorities adopt a broader policy with regard to transit duties on foreign goods imported into yunnan through tonkin reduce the railway freights and modify the existing scale of duties the realization of the full value of the country as a speedy and safe route to the central chinese markets with a consequent prosperity which would result will be lost to france and private enterprise which as yet has developed but slowly notwithstanding the undisputed agricultural and mineral wealth of the tonkin will be brought to a standstill End of chapter 4, part 2chapter five of a soldier of the legion by george mannington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five part one an execution a rebel chieftain a bid for liberty denam's mistake lin ni speaks a new road to tai nien in the enemy's country a sharp encounter cho trang the fever fiend in the hospital quang yin the five prisoners captured with Lin Yi were executed the first week in August. They had been tried and condemned by the native mandarins entrusted with the administration of justice. These functionaries had come over on purpose from Bac Ninh in the great state, and the execution took place in an open space in front of our fort. We supplied a guard and piquet for the occasion none of the rebels had given any information although it was whispered that the native judges had submitted them to torture during their interrogation we had no means of controlling these rumors for each morning the prisoners were handed over to the native police and they were returned at night and although they slept in the fort it was forbidden to communicate with them from their appearance and evident exhaustion i should be inclined to think they had suffered maltreatment there would be nothing very surprising in this for according to the native code of justice such methods were not only recommended but were actually indicated it is certain that the rebels showed no mercy to the loyal natives or french soldiers they captured alive fortunately it was rarely indeed that any of the latter fell into their hands and subsequently it was destined that i should witness shocking proofs of the terrible cruelty they were capable of employing it is therefore probable that the native judges made use of all the powers afforded them by the law of the land and did not employ european methods for which most likely they possessed supreme contempt the execution was carried out in a very simple and expeditious manner when a rectangular space had been cleared and lined by the troops the two mandarins dressed in robes of embroidered silk of which the dominant colors were red and gold their long hair neatly rolled in a new crepon turban took up a position in the middle of one side of the square and facing the center behind them were massed their retainers bannermen carried tattered triangular flags and coolies bore aloft enormous umbrellas two to each official whereon were painted in bright colors a quaint design of dragons and griffins 
Each Mandarin was also accompanied by a sword-bearer, a pipe-bearer, and a domestic, to whose care was confided a black lacquered box containing the areca nut and beetle leaf of his master. They formed a dirty, motley crowd without order or cohesion, clad in shabby, tattered, scarlet uniforms, and they laughed, chatted, or squabbled, one with the other, like a pack of old fishwives. They subsided into comparative silence, however, on the appearance of Captain Plessier, our commander, who occupied the place of honour a little in advance of the two judges. The prisoners were now brought into the enclosure under the escort of a few lin soldiers of the Mandarin Guard, whose dirty green uniforms and still dirtier rifles and accoutrements were certain proofs of their slovenly and undisciplined habits. Behind the little procession formed by the condemned men stalked the executioner, a tall native dressed in a red embroidered vest and black silk pantaloons. Upon his shoulder he carried a heavy curved sword, about three feet long, and a good deal broader at the end than near the handle. The five rebels, their hands tied behind them, walked to their death without any tremor or hesitation. Chatting together merrily, they threw curious glances at their surroundings, and expectorated from time to time, with evident unconcern, the red juice of the beetle leaf they were chewing. They were lined up, separated about four paces one from the other, on the opposite side of the square, occupied by the authorities, and facing them. As each of the prisoners reached the place assigned to him, a native soldier unbuttoned and turned back the collar of the rebel's vest. Then, one after the other, they knelt upon the grass, taking every care that their position should be as comfortable as the circumstances would allow. The sentence having been read aloud to the assembled natives, the executioner, after thrusting his finger into his mouth, traced a wet line of red beetle-juice across the back of the neck of the first of his victims, about half an inch above the last big vertebra. Stepping back a pace, he swung aloft his heavy sword with both hands. It poised a second in the air, there was a glitter in the bright sunlight as it descended then a swishing sound and a dull thud. The head of the first rebel, detached with a single blow, fell on the ground and rolled once over. From the severed neck a rich red stream shot out quite six feet over the grass. The body rocked once and subsided gently. Bending over it, the executioner touched the open arteries and smeared a little of the warm blood over his own lips as a charm against any evil influence from the spirit of the departed. The other prisoners, who had watched the execution of their comrade with evident interest, made flattering remarks concerning the skill of the swordsman. The next to die smiled and prepared himself calmly, stretching his neck as far forward as it was possible for him to do without losing his balance. I felt deadly sick and could not bring myself to watch the succeeding decapitations which were carried out with similar skill and expedition. The bodies of the condemned were handed over to their families, but their heads, attached to the top of a tall bamboo pole, were exposed at the entrance of the fort as an example to all rebels. The authorities had decided not to hurry on the trial of Ligny in the hope that they would eventually succeed in obtaining information from him. He was interrogated during several days by the two mandarins, who failed, however, to extract the slightest indication of the strength of the enemy or the whereabouts of their positions. After the departure of these functionaries, our commander made several attempts, with the aid of To as an interpreter, to break through the reserve of the chieftain, but without success. The treatment accorded him was a humane one. His diet was unstinted, and his parents, an aged white-haired couple, were allowed to visit him as often as they chose during the daytime. His wife, for so the woman whom we had found with him proved to be, remained constantly by him and attended to all his wants. To one privation only was he submitted, and that was the want of opium. 
on this point our captain was obdurate and though ligny who was well supplied with money offered to purchase the drug his craving was not allowed satisfaction to all his entreaties the same reply was given speak tell us what we ask of you and you shall have opium the very best at our expense only those who have witnessed the powerful hold the subtle drug takes on its votaries can imagine the torture endured by this native during the hours at which he had accustomed himself to indulge in his passion these agonies occurring shortly after the noon and evening meals would commence by protracted yawnings and develop into spasmodic nervous contractions of the body and limbs which broke into profuse perspiration unable to stand the strain the unhappy victim of the brilliant hued but treacherous flower or rather its seed would entreat his guards to supply him with the smallest particle at no matter what price then finding that his supplications were without avail he would break into a torrent of invective and malediction which grew in intensity and filthiness as his increasing and impotent rage neared its climax then speechless and foaming at the mouth he would fall back on the hard beaten clay floor of the veranda with mouth agape and black eyes fixed staring at the roof above his face pale yellow framed in the thick tangled mass of long black hair escaped from his fallen turban his chest would heave and crack under the short sharp pants which brought the air through the larynx with a whistling hiss thus would he continue for perhaps an hour until exhausted by the struggle he would fall into a sound sleep from which he would awake refreshed and smiling to laugh and chat with his guards his wife or parents if they happened to be present had there been any danger to ligny during these attacks i believe that opium or some anaesthetic would have been administered to him by our surgeon m joly who on several occasions was present during these crises on the twenty second august our prisoner made a daring bid for liberty during the night he had succeeded in picking the lock which secured the two heavy beams forming the stocks wherein his ankles were imprisoned at four in the morning profiting by the fact that the native sentry was slumbering though the soldier denied this and attributed the chieftain's escape to the miraculous ligny made a dash for the palisade and was astride it when a native sergeant who had heard the rattling of the bamboo ran to the spot from whence the sound came and succeeded in grasping a leg of the escaping rebel to which he clung shouting the while for help a few seconds later the prisoner was brought back and secured and the doctor attended to his wounds for he had been almost impaled during his struggle by the pointed bamboo poles of the palisade shortly after this incident a terrible tragedy occurred which brought about a complete change in the attitude of our prisoner and eventually made him a devoted partisan of the french cause ligny had enemies in the rebel camp and one of these desirous of taking over his honours and command informed de nam that the captive limbien had succumbed to pressure and had given information to the french he also provided evidence which was false to substantiate his declaration enraged at the apparent weakness of one of his most trusted lieutenants the rebel chief decided to make an example and he gave orders for the immediate seizure and execution of ligny's aged parents the details of this drama which i obtained from cho were confirmed by documents captured later from the rebels i had an opportunity of perusing them while serving on the staff of the first brigade some months later at daylight on the morning of the twenty eighth august the european sentry at the gate of nha nam found a basket which had been deposited outside during the night on being opened it was found to contain two heads and a letter addressed to our prisoner it is unnecessary to give further explanation or to describe in morbid details the reception of this strange parcel by the unfortunate Lin certain it is that its effect was immediate 
for that very evening i saw our ci-devant rebel who had just returned from a long interview with our commander under the veranda his former prison where he was squatting side by side with to with whom he was engaged in a most friendly conversation whilst with some damp clay and split bamboo he was constructing with nimble fingers neat little models of the different fortified positions belonging to his chief of yesterday from that time forward he was allowed all the opium he cared to smoke and though for his own safety he preferred to remain in the fort during several weeks he was liberated and lodgings were assigned to his wife in the native soldiers village Ligny now became a scout and guide to the French columns, and as such he rendered immense services to the authorities, concerning which more will be mentioned hereafter. Eventually he was made a Mandarin, and is now a local prefect of a district formerly overrun by rebellion. He and To became fast friends, and from their evening talks, when the black smoke hung thick under the thatch, i was able to derive much amusement and some knowledge owing to information furnished by Ni, the authorities decided to reconnoitre a road which had not been visited by french troops since eighteen eighty six when a column under major duguin went by it from ten dao the old name for nha nam to tai nguyen an important town situated on the sung Kao river about twenty miles as the crow flies to the northwest of nha nam this road had probably been constructed several centuries before but owing to the depopulation of the districts through which it passed and also to its proximity to the forest-covered mountainous region to the south it was now but a path which in some places completely disappeared in the ever-advancing jungle from a military point of view the reconnaissance of this route was of the greatest importance since should it be found practicable to infantry it would be possible to make use of it when the time served as the means of advance for a column destined to attack the enemy's position on the right flank at tai nguyen there was a garrison consisting of two companies of the foreign legion one of native infantry a section of mountain artillery and a detachment of militia my squad formed part of the small column which left nha nam on the fourth of september at five in the morning to explore this road though it had been supposed that the distance to be covered would not exceed twenty-five miles we actually marched close upon thirty-five before reaching our destination at intervals we were obliged to cut our way through the vegetation which had invaded the track and it was only by using the utmost care that our little party succeeded in keeping in the right direction on several occasions we disturbed big herds of deer which scampered away on our approaching them the tracks of tigers were frequently visible and once the advance guard consisting of half a dozen tirailleurs were considerably startled by the presence of a fine python which lay basking in the sun close by the track it was only after several stones had been thrown at it that the big snake decided on withdrawing into the long grass owing to the advisability of concealing our movements from the enemy it was deemed necessary not to make use of firearms on this occasion the men suffered much owing to the extreme heat the path was in the worst of conditions and we were obliged to twice ford a river which though not very deep was exceedingly rapid so that our expedition proved to be a very arduous one to all who took part in it it was nearly eight p m and quite dark when we reached our destination and several of the men fell exhausted whilst waiting in the ranks for a hut to be prepared for us to pass the night in tai nguyen possessed a fine citadel of the vauban style which was built in seventeen ninety eight and it was in this that the garrison dwelt the town and its neighbourhood was at this time infested by tigers which prowled about the streets after dark so that it was imprudent for the inhabitants to go out without a torch or a light of some kind so great was the voracity and daring of these animals that on several occasions they had penetrated into the citadel and carried off dogs and goats belonging to the garrison 
indeed the doctor by an extraordinary stroke of good luck killed one with a revolver shot as it was groping under his bed in search of a favorite pointer which had taken refuge there report had it that the lucky slayer of this greedy feline was so excited by his good fortune that he was found more dead than alive by the guard who ran to the hut on hearing the report of the weapon he lost his dog however for the poor animal was found to be quite dead its skull crushed beneath the powerful paw of its enemy our column having proved that the road explored could if necessary serve as a means of penetration into the enemy's country left ta nguyen on its return journey the next day at four p m Flipte had been in charge of the topographical work during our exploration, and his sketch of the route so pleased Major Berard, who commanded our battalion and was also in charge of the military zone, that my chum was detained at Tai Nguyen and attached to the staff there. I was very sorry to lose him, but for his sake was glad of this change in his prospects, as his new position brought with it a greater chance of promotion our party did not return to nha nam by the same route it had come but took a better known and more frequented track passing more to the south through a district more populated and consequently better cultivated on our way back we slept one night at kasong tuang a small fort garrisoned by a detachment of militia under the orders of a european officer we continued our journey the following morning and reached nha nam at six p m owing to the fact that the military authorities were now in possession of reliable information concerning the rebel strength and positions orders were issued by the brigade for reconnaissances to be made from time to time into the district north of our fort with a view to exploring the region and obtaining topographical sketches of the country to be used in the production of a reliable map for the use of the officers who were to assist in the big column which the government had decided to put in the field during the winter months i took part in the first of these little expeditions on the twelfth september the object of which was to determine whether the tracks to long tuang a rebel village which had not been visited since january was still accessible to infantry and also to see if the hamlet was inhabited and fortified we started out from nha nam at three in the afternoon as it was not intended to make any attack on the enemy should they be in force our detachment was a weak one composed only of thirty legionaries and as many tirailleurs in order to make things easy for the europeans for the heat was very oppressive we were instructed to take with us only the six packets of ammunition contained in our belt pouches thirty-six rounds fortunately for us all the tirailleurs who accompanied us started with a hundred and twenty rounds per man we arrived within a quarter of a mile of our destination which was about a league and a half to the north of our position without incident the fields were well cultivated and the rice was being harvested but on our approach the reapers all women fled with loud cries towards the hamlet it is probable that the suspicions of captain plessier were aroused for by his order we left the path extended and advanced towards the village across the cultivated ground a small reserve remaining upon the track under the orders of lieutenant bennett when about two hundred yards from the position we were received by a hot fire from a strong party of the enemy occupying the hamlet our line halted and took cover by kneeling behind the little embankments which separated one field from the other from here we replied to the rebels but a few minutes later were exposed to a severe cross-fire coming from the left flank and in less time than it takes to describe a tirailleur was killed and two others and one legionary were wounded the enemy who took part in this flanking movement were some of de nam's regulars who came from their entrenched positions in the forest having been summoned to assist by their friends in the village who for this purpose made use of long copper speaking trumpets the weird bellowings of which we could hear above the reports of the rifles and the repeated words of command 
Our reserve had extended on our left at right angles to our line, but its fire failed to keep the enemy in check, and very soon we could distinguish their skirmishers as they advanced in line at regular intervals, dropping now and again on one knee to discharge their rifles at us the situation was getting too warm to be pleasant and most of the legionaries having expended their slender stock of ammunition it was found necessary to distribute among us the cartridges of the men who had been placed hors de combat and also to take a few packets from each of the native infantrymen thanks to the wall-like ridges behind which we lay we suffered no further casualties but our cartridges were getting scarcer each minute and we felt that should any of the enemy succeed in getting out of the village by an exit which might possibly exist other than the door before us there would be a possibility of an attack on our right flank and consequently a danger of the road to nha nam being closed to us it was very soon found necessary to restrict the efforts of the native troops to volley firing for notwithstanding the repeated efforts of their french sergeants they expended their ammunition with reckless extravagance when acting independently the majority of them not waiting to select a suitable target or to aim carefully just loosed off into space happy so long as the excitement created by the report of their rifle and the smell of their burning powder stayed their rising fears this was the first time i had seen our captain under fire and it was a supreme satisfaction to me to note that his attitude came up in every respect to the descriptions given me by my comrades senior to myself in the service calm and collected he had an eye for every detail and seemed to foresee each new development in the situation he was never a man of many words and now he spoke only to give some short crisp order to the bugler or to a non-commissioned officer though he happened that day to be dressed in a suit of white drill he was the only one among us who took no cover and was in consequence the target for many a rebel rifle as he walked coolly up and down behind the line of our crouching figures his helmet cocked over his right ear a cigarette between his lips flicking his leggings every now and again with the cane he carried he seemed to defy death itself this attitude inspired his men with enthusiastic confidence and every legionary present would have hailed with joy an order from him to fix bayonets and charge right at the enemy the action had lasted but a few minutes when the order to retreat by echelons was given the object of the reconnaissance had been accomplished for it was clear that the track followed was accessible and also that the village was occupied in force as an outpost and under the circumstances it would have been a culpable breach of the art of war a wanton invitation to disaster to have continued the engagement our retirement was not effected without some difficulty for the enemy showed considerable daring and initiative in harassing our retreat and our progress was slow because we were embarrassed by our dead and wounded some difficulty was also experienced by the french sergeants in keeping their tirailleurs in hand and it was undoubtedly due to their efforts and also to the example of cool steadiness displayed by the legionaries that our withdrawal was saved from degenerating into a total sauve qui peut it was found necessary to tell off men of my corps to bear away our comrades who were hors de combat for the native troops were too plainly victims to shattered nerves to bear the strain of this task under fire this somewhat reduced the strength of our little firing line which however received some assistance from lieutenant bennett who picked up a rifle and downed several of our eager pursuers for he was a first-class marksman the enemy abandoned their attack when we were about a mile from nha nam but it was a band of tired and thirsty men that reached the shelter of our position that evening at seven warned by our captain who had galloped on ahead of us as soon as all danger had ceased the guard turned out and rendered the usual honours to the dead and wounded as they were borne through the gate of the fort the wounded were at once attended to in the infirmary and were transferred under escort the next morning to the hospital at phulang thuong 
on the day following our engagement the whole garrison turned out under arms to assist at the funeral of the tirailleur who had been killed he was buried in the small well-kept cemetery situated just below the slope to the northwest of our position the french people have had at all times a great respect for their dead and their soldiers who lot it has been to lay down their life au champ d'honneur as they so eloquently express it have always received their full share of the respect paid to the departed in france there exists a fund known as l'oeuvre des tombes subscribed to by thousands of the charitable public and the money thus obtained is expended on the hundreds of far-away colonial graveyards which are kept in excellent order and in erecting an iron cross bearing the name and corps of the deceased over the last resting-place of each soldier of the republic who falls in fight or dies of disease this is done without restriction of race or religion i went to see to that evening and found ligny with him they both amused me by their evident regret at not having assisted in the engagement of the previous day the little sergeant's complaints were based on plain unsatisfied bloodthirstiness those of my ex-rebel friend clearly originated in that spirit of unslakable vengeance which only an asiatic can acquire it was instructive to note how they after each pipe of opium built fresh plans and devised new methods for the merciless slaughter of their enemies from them i learnt that a spy had come in during the day with information that de tam the most capable of all the rebel military leaders had been in command of the troops that had attacked us and that this famous captain for whom they evidently cherished much hate and a good deal of reluctant admiration had been severely wounded towards the end of the fight his left arm having been shattered by a bullet just below the shoulder this proved to be a fact i met the famous chieftain in 1897 when he was a partisan of the french and the crippled state of his limb due no doubt to the elementary treatment of the wound by the native medicine man was an evident proof of it I passed many pleasant evenings with To and Nhi, who would favor me with stories of war and love, legends of ancient origin, in which the actors were demigods, dragons, and genie, and strange fables full of local color, replete with quaint proverbs and philosophical axioms dear to the disciples of Confucius. Unfortunately, I was soon to be deprived of the real pleasure obtained from these foregatherings, for my section received orders to proceed to Cho Trang, and I was thus immediately separated from my two friends. It was not without some regret that I accepted this hazard of a soldier's life, against which one should not murmur, and I was really sorry that the opportunity afforded me for the study of the complex characteristics of To and Yi should have been such a brief one. End of chapter 5, part 1